All right, we are good to go. Um, hi guys, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are new to our masterclass series, my name is Chloe. I'm the video editor here at Jazz Only Think Center, um, but have been hosting some of these masterclasses, um, which has been great. Um, in just a minute, we're going to join Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra trumpeter Kenny Rampton um, to get some of his insights into playing. He'll be doing a Q&A um, with Seton Hawkins, who's from the Jazz at Lincoln Center education team, um, and Seton will be sort of leading uh, the conversation today. Um, but if you do have a question uh, throughout the session, please feel free to use the raise hand function. Uh, if you click the participants tab at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the raise hand button. Go ahead and use that and we'll get to you. Um, we're gonna try to get to as many people as possible. Um, if you don't feel comfortable raising your hand, feel free to shoot a question or a comment into the chat. We'll be monitoring that as well. Um, and Kenny and Seaton sort of wanna keep this open. So um, feel free to raise your hand at any point throughout the session and we will do our best to get to you. Um, all right, I am going to shut up now and turn it over to Seaton and to Kenny. Um, enjoy everybody. Hi, everyone. So when Kenny and I were talking about what to do today for this session, one of the things that we discussed was that a lot of young musicians reach out to members of the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra and certainly members of the staff as well for guidance on what they can be doing in developing their careers, particularly early on uh, in terms of what you can be doing both musically, but also in terms of your personal development, your career development. And so what we thought today is that Kenny and I will have a chat about some of the things that he discovered early in his career, things that he might pass on as advice in this particular moment. And again, this will be a chat between us, but if you have questions, if things are coming up, feel free to raise your hand or put them into the chat window and we'll get to them. The hope is to have something that's informal, uh, but also that really gets into some useful tricks for developing your career uh, and some useful strategies for just continuing to, to grow as a person. So with that, I thought, Kenny, why don't we start with your uh, initial memories in terms of your musical training and education. We think about maybe your early gigs. Can you sort of set the stage for where you were early in your career and how those initial steps towards where you've gotten to today took place? Sure. Thanks, Seton. And it's good to, good to be here again, man. Good to see uh, some people signing on. Um, before I kind of start with that, uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for coming and, and uh, checking this out. Um, I know as we're in, in New York, we're in phase one, I guess, with, you know, starting businesses up and starting to be able, be able to interact with people again. And for me, that's something that I've missed desperately. And so it's good to see, uh, see you guys, see you folks. Um, cause that's for me. And I think for humankind, it's, it's so important to interact. So, um, thank you all for being here. It's, it's important to me. And, and for that reason, um, we want to start it up, start off from the get go with, um, having a Q and a, if anybody has any questions, anybody wants to chime in, uh, I want to make sure that I get to any questions that anybody might have for me. Uh, from the get-go as opposed to waiting until the end and then we don't have enough time to get to everybody which which often happens so um, but with that said you know in terms of my early career and coming up um, you know I I'm from Las Vegas I was born and raised in Las Vegas Nevada my father was a musician he played on the strip he toured with Elvis Presley he played with Frank Sinatra with all the Rat Pack guys um, my mother was a musician she taught piano um, piano was my first first instrument percussion my second um, for my mom and dad, I've always been involved in music and I've always known that that's what I wanted to do from the time I was probably nine, 10 years old. I started trumpet when I was 11 uh, in sixth grade. And I remember in sixth grade, they had a, a career day, you know, and all the kids, you know, it was like an assembly. All the kids got together in the gymnasium. And those of us who knew what we wanted to do dressed the part, you know, so there were kids dressed in a suit you know, talking about they wanted to be a lawyer or kids dressed like firemen or doctors or, or whatever. I put on a, a black suit with a black bow tie and went with my trumpet and I played the theme to Rocky, you know, because I knew when I was 11 years old, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play the trumpet. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, once I became serious about, you know, anything really, um, I couldn't ever imagine myself doing anything else. Um, 
so, you know, my formative years, like through high school, you know, I studied with teachers. I got up early and I practiced. I was serious. I worked hard at it. Um, my first gig, uh, professional gig, was with my dad's band playing for the church that, that our family went to, playing a dance. He had me come up and, and play uh, Feel So Good by Chuck Mangione. And um, uh, one other song, um, a blues, it was actually stolen from Duke Ellington. Um, they, they called it Night Train, but it was actually, it, it was derived from a Duke Ellington comp composition named Happy Go Lucky Local. Um, at the time, I didn't know that, but um, those are the first two songs I performed professionally. My dad paid me, I think, $20, you know, and then later on when I was 16, my first gig playing in Vegas with professionals other than my dad and his band was um, backing up Lola Falana on the strip, um, subbing on New Year's Eve to, to play with Lola Falana. And... Um, you know, it's just all I ever wanted to do. So, you know, I, I, and I knew it took practice. I knew how to be serious about it. When I went to college at UNLV for two years, I, I studied classical and jazz. I played in symphonies. I played in the All-State Symphony. I was first trumpet in, in the Nevada All-State Symphony through high school. But I always wanted to play jazz. And um, I remember my trumpet teacher one time in a lesson, I, I came unprepared and made excuses and he was furious with me and, and berated me for a few minutes and then said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to play jazz. And he said, well, you have no idea what that means. He said, I've seen you come, you know, I, I've seen you in rehearsals. He said, he's come to the jazz band rehearsals and sees me and my friends sitting there wearing funny hats and glasses thinking we're cool. He said, that's not what jazz is. He said, jazz music is an art form. And if you want to be serious about it, you have to commit your life to it. And he, it was some, some pretty hard truth that he, that he laid on me. And he said, don't expect to ever make any money. Don't expect to ever have a family or a home or a car. Um, he said, you dedicate your art, your, your life to the art, and the art will take care of you. Um, and I took that to heart, you know, and I started studying jazz, started transcribing, started learning how to play bass lines on the trumpet, started learning standards, going through the keys with them, started playing free music, playing freely improvising with people. And um, that's when I started to get serious about it. And um, so I, I, that's, that's when I was in college. I was at UNLV. I was there for two years and then um, applied to the Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Uh, went to school there and saw really kind of how I compared to some of the top players in the country at that time. Now, when I was at Berkeley, I was in college with Jeff Keezer, Roy Hargrove, um, Antonio Hart, uh, Joshua Redmond was going to school at Harvard down the road, but we all used to play jam sessions together. And I saw how I stacked up against those guys, and I, I was a beginner. Those guys were, were all way, way ahead of me. And um, I, I had to work hard. You know, I, I had to really just put in the time, spend time in the shed, and to be able to try and catch up, to, to get, you know, learn some of the language of the music, and, and I did. And I always kept that in mind that Walt, Walt told me that it's about, you know, it's about the art form. You got to dedicate yourself to the art. And so the next logical step after uh, I left Berkeley was um, to move to New York because that's where the music thrives. Now I moved to New York with the intention of being in a community of other like-minded players so I could learn and grow and create art. It wasn't about coming to New York to get a gig. It wasn't about coming to New York to become a star, make money, anything like that. It was always about the art and, and respecting the art form. So I came to New York with that intention. And um, I found pretty early on that when you, like, like Walt Blanton told me, when you dedicate yourself to the art, the art will take care of you. And it has. And um, that's true in life. You know, I've worked with a lot of kids over the years and find that if you live your life with a certain integrity, which is really what that is, um, then it's going to take you to a higher place than you knew existed, honestly. And the decisions you make right now determine uh, what your next choice, uh, choices are. And the decisions, every time that you make a decision, it takes you to another set of decisions. And when you follow your higher path and make the right choice every time, it's, it's going to lead you down a, a life path that is on a, on a higher level. You know, so just very basic decisions. Am I going to throw this wrapper on the ground or am I going to wait till I find a trash can? Little things like that even are important. Every decision matters. You know, being present is of the utmost importance. So, um, 
you know, that's kind of how I live my life. It's how I've lived my life for a long time. And um, through my career and my career choices, people I play with, you know, I made a vow a long time ago not to cancel on people. Somebody calls me for a gig and I commit to it, I show up. I don't cancel because somebody else calls me for a gig at the same time that pays $50 more. Um, because reputation matters, you know, and integrity matters. So um, it's interesting because I actually led a panel discussion for the Jack Rudin competition, which is a college version of essentially Ellington at, at Jazz Lincoln Center, with uh, Bijan Watson, who's one of the leading uh, trumpet players in Los Angeles, with Camille Thurman and um, Mark Whitfield, uh, world-renowned jazz guitarist. And the, the discussion was about being successful in a career of music, how to be successful. And we each kind of shared our life path, our stories, how we got to where we are, who we met, who helped us. And whereas each story was very unique, there were a few common denominators for each one of us. And those common denominators, number one, is show up on time. On time doesn't mean the gig starts at 8, you show up at 8. You show up at 7.30, that's on time. Anytime after that, you're late. Um, you don't want to stress out your band leader saying, man, where's Kenny at? Gig starts in five minutes. No, you got to be there at least half an hour early. Um, number two, play your butt off. Be prepared. There's a lot, a lot of things we as musicians need to do to prepare. And I'm going to get in a little bit of that later, like practicing fundamentals and, and studying the music and things like that. But show up and play your butt off. You know, don't just be prepared, but be, be as good as you can possibly be when you play. Be better than anybody else if you can, and certainly be the best that you can be. That's number two. Number three is get along with people. I can't even count how many people I know who are some of the baddest people on the planet when it comes to playing their instrument, but their egos are so out of control, nobody wants to hire them because mm -hmm. they're a drag to be around. So that's incredibly important, especially when you're in a band like Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra, who in regular times, we're touring half of the year, pretty much. At least five months out of the year, we're on tour. And when we're not on tour, we're doing a concert series or concert season in Manhattan. So we're around each other all the time. And it's really an, uh, an extended family. So it's so important to just be able to get along with other people. And it's amazing how many people just can't do that. But those who do and follow those three things um, generally have pretty successful careers. And it's not that hard to do, really, man. You know, prepare yourself, be prepared, play your butt off, show up on time and be cool. You know, it's, that's kind of what it comes down to. And that's more or less what I've uh, tried to do my entire career. And, and I'm, I'm doing just fine. I feel very good about where I'm at in my career. Um, I have several great gigs, <laughs> you know. And um, I'm very blessed to be where I'm at. But I'm also, you know, I've worked hard at it. I've, and I've made it a point to get along with people. It's important to be a good person. And, you know, that's, that's so important just to be a good person, man, you know, and operate at a higher level um, consciously, you know, to, to re really create a good vibe, vibration around you so people want to be around you. And so you can affect people in a positive way through, through the art of jazz music and jazz education. Um, so, I mean, in terms of um, some of my career, you know, opportunities, career choices that I've had, you know, I've, I've been very lucky because um, once I came to New York, you know, I spent some time working at, um, at a bank, you know, as a bank teller. I did all kinds of temp jobs and, and whatnot to get by. I played in the subway, um, played on the streets, you know, I was, I was really broke for a long time, but I was happy because I was in a community of people writing music, playing music, having jam sessions all the time being creative, studying the art, you know, and I was actually very happy. And um, one day I got a call. Uh, I, met, I met a trumpet player in a, in a rehearsal after working at the bank. Um, there was a rehearsal once a week. There was, uh, you know, it didn't pay any money. It was just for, for people like me who wanted to keep their chops together and, and network and, and whatnot. And I met a trumpet player who was with Ray Charles Band. And he called me up. Uh, actually, he gave Ray my number uh, and Ray called me up a couple months later and um, I started working with Ray Charles once you get a gig like that with somebody who at the time Ray Charles was very well known and very popular and you know everybody knows his music and once people hear that you're working with Ray Charles they're, hey let's get that guy with Ray Charles 
you know, and then the career starts to take off from there. So one thing led to another, led to another with, uh, in terms of career from Ray Charles to Panama Francis, I got Panama Francis gig because the lead alto with Ray Charles also played with Panama Francis and Panama needed a trumpet player, you know, and then with Jimmy McGriff's quartet and then Lionel Hampton's band, Illinois Jaquette's big band, um, so on and so forth, uh, the Mingus big band, um, and uh, things just, you know, started to take off from there. You make a really interesting point, and I'm hoping we can touch on it now. Uh, you talked about it in the, the beginning of what you were looking to do. You were talking about the idea of establishing community. And you talked about the community in Boston. You talked about the community in New York. And you also talked about the rehearsal band as another piece of community and laying that groundwork for some of the professional uh, goals and achievements. So for people who are just starting out, how do you go about establishing that sense of camaraderie with other musicians? How do you get your name out there? How do you approach it with integrity where you're confident about what you're doing, but also being humble about it too? All right, for, I mean, for somebody young coming up who, um, who wants to break into the scene, you know, um, it's those three things, you know, even if it's free, like I was talking about with, you know, there was a free rehearsal band. I was working, I, I was opening up safe deposit boxes for people at uh, Chemical Bank, which was bought out by Chase later, and, but it was up by the Museum of Natural History. And, um, you know, it's, it's, that's how I was paying the bills. And, um, but there was a rehearsal band that met once a week. And like I said, people just get together and play, didn't pay any money. Um, and, uh, you just played to meet people and, and to play, get a chance to play, keep your chops together, get to play music, you know, and you could write for it. You could bring in original music too, which was cool. Um, so it was about the community it was, and it was about learning and growing. It was about the art back to that. Um, so people, you know, who are new in town, if you have the right intention, um, it's going to pay off. You know, if you come in town because you want to be a star and you tell people you don't want to play for free if it doesn't pay, um, be, be careful what you wish for because you're not going to get called to play. People who are in it because they believe in the art, because they want to play, um, are going to get called. You know, and then when that gig, you know, happens where it pays $1,000 a person, um, guess who they're going to call, you know. Um, but it's it's not about making money it's it's about the art and when you when you dedicate yourself to that people people know it and so anybody who moves to new york you know the the best advice i can give you is play every opportunity that you get every chance you have have to play whether it's a jam session whether it's a free rehearsal whether it's subbing for somebody on a gig on a door gig whatever don't let money be what drives you play with people you want to play with and play as much as you can. You want to build your reputation and whether, whether you're conscious of building your reputation or not, you're doing just that. So if you build a reputation, you know, and the, the, the says, I'm not going to play unless you pay me so much money, you know, that you're going to have that reputation. And if you show up late, somebody typed in here, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're fired. <laughs> that's actually accurate, whoever typed that. Uh, what does that say? John Charles Thomas. Thank you for that, because that's actually correct. Um, uh, you're building your reputation all the time, whether you think of it in those terms or not. So, you know, live your life that way, man. Show up early, you know, and um, be cool. Just get along with people. You know, it's, it's a job, you know, people want to hang out with, with people who they like, you know, they want to hire you on the bandstand because you're hanging out between sets too, no matter how good you play. If you're a jerk between sets to everybody you're around because your ego is out of control, nobody is going to hire you. It's as simple as that. And I've seen some of the greatest musicians on the planet um, struggle and have very unsuccessful careers behind huge egos. You know, check your ego at the door. It's important. You know, just be cool. Get along with people. Treat people how you want to be treated. Be, be a good person, man. You know, that's so important, you know. Um, you know, and play your butt off, man. You know, so anybody who's new in town, go to every jam session that you can find. You know, bring a notepad with you. Bring like a little, I have a little notebook. I'm not sure where it's, it's, it's on the table over there. Anyways, I have a little notebook that's about this big. It's small. 
but I carry it with me everywhere. If I go to a jam session that I, and I want to play and there's a tune I don't know, I don't play it. I write down the title of the tune and the key that they play it in. And then I go home and I shed it. So next time I go to that jam session, I'm ready for it. You know, don't play tunes that you don't know. And when I say that you don't know, you got to know the form, you got to know the changes, and you got to know the melody. You can't blow on a tune if all you know is a melody. You got to study, you got to practice. So, you know, and, and it never ends. You know, studying and practicing never ends. That's the beauty of music. You know, no matter how good you get, there's always room for growth and improvement. You know, so there's no reason to ever become uh, cocky. There's no reason to ever become complacent or bored. Um, that's, that's what I love about music is you can always learn, you can always grow. And um, it's, it's a wonderful profession for that reason. Um, and it's a wonderful art form and a, just a great way of life, you know, to always know that tomorrow when I get up, I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to be a little better tomorrow than I was today. And there's no reason not to be. So it's a pretty, you know, it's pretty cool that way. You know, I really, I, I love what I do. I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Now, to this end, this idea of diving in, taking these opportunities when they're coming to you, if we think about the energy that's required to be able to do that, to jump in, there's two questions that I would ask on that front if you're thinking about sort of building a sustainable career. The first would be your thoughts on how a young artist can avoid burning out. And the second is, even as you're building, even as you're making progress, there's going to be setbacks, challenges, disappointments. Maintaining a positive attitude during this time, particularly early when there's a lot of challenges, how do you manage that as well? So I guess two questions on burnout and on maintaining a a positive outlook and goal. Okay. Um, those are deep questions. Thank you, Seton. Um, in terms of burnout, um, I've gotten burnt out. You know, I'm not going to lie. There have been points where I just didn't want to play. I, you know, um, when I get to that point where I feel burnt out, I'm tired of what I'm doing for whatever reason. Now, it hasn't happened for a number of years since I started doing, doing this. Um, I kind of stumbled onto this by accident um that when i start to feel burnt out by you know by playing or, or gigging or whatever i counter that with teaching and i've discovered that when i start teaching more i'm reminded why i started playing in the first place and i see students when i work with students I see like, you know, this is going to sound weird, but I see them as, as reflections of myself. When I, when I see a student, it, it, it reminds me of who I was when I was their age. And, and I remember how I was looking up to my teachers or, or people that I admired at that age. And it helps me to see where I'm at in a different way, in a different light, and helps me to feel better about <laughs> what I'm doing and helps me to get out, the, get out of that feeling of being burnt out. So that's honestly how I deal with, um, with burnout is through education. And um, the more involved with education that I get, the more I excited I get about playing. And it's a very interesting thing for me. So that's, that's how I personally deal with, with burnout. Um, there's also, you know, if, if you're burning out, sometimes it's good to take a break, you know. And with the trumpet, it's difficult physically to take a break from playing this instrument. Now, I always like to have the trumpet near me when I'm talking because I just talk better when I'm holding it in my hands for some reason. But um, uh, as, as I say that, I forget what I was saying. Um, when, when, I'm, when I'm teaching, it makes me want to play more. And when I play, when I practice more, it reminds me of who I really am. I used to actually... Uh, I would value myself as a person. I put my self-worth as a person on who I was as a player. So if, if I had a gig and I played a bad solo or even a bad phrase inside of a solo, I would get into a funk. I would not, I would devalue myself as a person. And it's important not to do that, you know, and I did that to, to the point where I would get depressed. I used to really have issues with depression when I was younger. And um, it's very important to realize that everybody has a bad day 
when you're playing, you know, and don't let that determine who you are as a person, you know, because generally most people aren't listening anyways. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, burnout happens for a v variety of reasons. You might have a bad solo, then you get upset with yourself. And, you know, you might, I've, I've gone through periods where day after day, I just didn't feel like I was connecting with the horn. I didn't feel like I was connecting with the spirit of music. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's good to just take, take a day off. And that's where I was at, was, was talking about that, take, taking a day off. And sometimes with the trumpet, it's difficult to do that physically because all the muscles that you've got to maintain in here and in, in here, the buccinators and all these muscles are very small. You know, so to maintain the strength in those muscles, you've got to practice every day. So if you take a, a day off, you're going to feel it. If you take two days off, you're going to really feel it. If you take three days off, three days off the whole world is going to feel it. That's how it seems. Um, so you've got to be careful with taking time off, but sometimes it's, essentially to take, it's essential to take time off if, you, if you're feeling burnt, burnt out. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll get something in my shoulder or my elbow when I'm playing just from overuse or if I'm playing a lot of plunger, you know, my left shoulder, you know, I'm holding the plunger like this. My left shoulder start, start to get sore, you know, so sometimes physically it's important to do that. So that helps with burnout sometimes. It can be physical burnout. It can be mental burnout, any, any, any of those things. And also, if I'm having burnout, um, if I'm just feeling burnt out, um, I find it helps if I listen to certain musicians. Now, my go-to is, um, is Miles Davis. Um, that live record... Was it called Four More or My Funny Valentine Live? That that record where somebody screams in the middle of Stella by Starlight. Yes. In the audience. <laughs> That's my favorite recorded music of all time. You know, if I'm feeling burnt out, I'll turn off the lights, put on that recording, and close my eyes and sit and listen intensely to that recording and breathe along with the music, and that helps me get out of it too. But I think education, um, taking time off, or practicing, depending on what I need to do, or, and, and listening, all those things help me with burnout. Um, the other question was, uh, was what, Seaton? Well, around maintaining a positive attitude, and I think you, you, you've addressed both of those, but you brought up a third point that I'm hoping we can talk about. You mentioned physical burnout. So the other piece to be contemplating um, is strategies that you've developed that allow you to have the chops to take on a wide range of gigs uh, that also would allow you to play maybe long sessions, multiple sessions in a day. What are you doing or what, you know, did you learn to do in your, uh, in your career development in terms of technique that gave you a more sustainable path? Okay. Well, that's, that's easy. That's um, fundamentals. And this is true for any instrumentalist. You got to practice fundamentals of the instrument. You can't bypass those and think you want to be a jazz musician and just play jazz and not deal with the fundamentals of your instrument, regardless of what it is. Whether it's, it's drums and you got you got to do your rudiments. If it's a brass instrument, there's a whole series of things you got to do to be able to play the instrument. You know, and there's five fundamentals with the trumpet. I'll briefly mention all of them. Um, first is sound. I always put that one first because that affects every other uh, fundamental. So you you practice. You play exercises to develop your sound. You play long tones um, is, is most common um, to develop your sound. Next is flexibility, going from one partial to the next. The instrument is built on a series of partials. As you, I'll show you this real briefly, you don't need to use the vowels at all. So there's three different partials. And then keep going up. All right, so there's two octaves of partials that you don't use the vowels for. You change from note to note with airspeed, uh, with vibration of the lips. D different things affect that. It's, um, you can think of the trumpet like, you know, that tube that you get at the World Fair, the, the State Fair, whatever, that you spin around and it goes, oh. Then you do a little bit faster, it goes, oh. And the faster you do it, the higher the pitch goes. That's essentially what a trumpet is. You're just moving the air faster, which causes vibration. Um, of the lips, um, the back pressure, which creates the sound. Um, so you move the air faster, the pitch goes up to the next partial. So um, lip flexibility exercises to develop that so you can go from one, one partial to the next. Um, that's the second, second fundamental. Third, uh, finger technique. Um, just moving, you know, finger, finger, finger patterns, practicing, practicing your scales, technical studies. 
All right, fourth is artic articulation, how you tongue notes, different ways of articulating notes, um, whether it's long, short, um, combinations of articulation, double tonguing, single tonguing, triple tonguing, doodle tonguing, all different ways of articulating the notes. And fifth, uh, I was put this one last because it's the first thing that young trumpet players always want to talk about is range and playing in the upper register and developing that. So as a trumpet player, you know, we all got to deal with all five fundamentals every single day. I practice them every day. Um, and by doing that, that prepares you to be able to play whatever music is put in front of you. Now, when I do, you know, my other gig is, um, or one of my other gigs, uh, full-time gigs, is, is doing the music for Sesame Street. Now, when I, when I go to do that, um, go to the recording studio, I don't get the music beforehand. Um, I can if I want to, but I usually don't, I don't need to. If, if it's something specifically for piccolo trumpet or something that's really technically demanding, you know, I'll ask them to let me know. But um, I generally don't see it till I get to the studio and get to the studio and uh, we immediately start recording. There's no time to practice. But if you're fundamentally sound, you don't really need to. You know, you just, you're, you're good enough to be able to sight read it when the red light goes on to record. So, you know, I, it's crucial to be fundamentally sound, to be ready for any gig, any situation. And especially if you're a jazz musician, you're an improviser. You want to be able to play what you hear in your mind when you play. You want to be true to the melody that you're creating or the spontaneous composition that you're creating, which is improvisation and playing a solo. So you never know what you're going to hear. It could, it could be anything, you know, and you got to be ready to be able to execute that. So it's important to, uh, to practice fundamentals every day, dedicate part of the day every single day to, um, to fundamental practice it is crucial on any instrument. Absolutely. Now, in terms of um, building up the chops so that you can be playing in a wide range of settings, that you can be ready for any particular type of gig, this ties into another thing that I think is on a lot of younger musicians' minds or, or artists who are just starting to develop their professional careers, which I guess we could broadly term as the question of, of selling out. So what are your thoughts in terms of getting a diverse range of work when you're young, um, managing in terms of what you're trying to do artistically, but also against, you know, having a sustainable career, having, um, uh, you know, being able to make rent, what are some of your thoughts on how you balance that as an artist? Well, um, you know, I, I play a very wide variety of stuff. I don't just jazz. I play a lot of commercial music. I always have. Um, I love Latin music. I've done a lot of Latin work. Um, I love horn sex and stuff. I've toured with Matchbox 20. I've worked with Shaka Khan. Um, I've, I've done a pretty wide variety of stuff, and I've never seen it as selling out, personally. I play music that I love to, to play, and also, you know, I need to make a living, you know, and I got to pay the rent, and I got to buy food, and that's a reality, and to, to play music, you know, there's a period where I played a lot of weddings, mm -hmm. and... Um, I'm very grateful for that period because it, it helped me to be able to get through, you know, just helped me to be able to pay the rent, helped me to be able to, to survive. And, and I made a lot of friends and they're still my friends. I saw one of them online a couple of days ago, a great piano player. This guy's like a walking encyclopedia of tunes. He knows every tune you could think of named uh, Ken, uh, Ken Levinsky. He's, he's in New Jersey and he does a weekly thing. And we used to play weddings together. He would do, play cocktail hour for the piano. And now and then I would get to play with him. We'd play tunes and it was so much fun because he knows every tune ever written pretty much. Um, he does mostly that kind of work though. And he was doing like a, you know, a live cocktail hour on Facebook or whatever from the backyard of a band leader we both used to work for named Bud Malton, uh, who's, a, who's a fine saxophone player who plays that music, plays commercial music, uh, plays weddings. And that's how he's built his career. And he's had a very successful career and more power to him. You know, because, I mean, there was a period where I had to go through an embouchure change and I, I really was struggling playing the trumpet. I had to take time off and I had to start back, start, start up again and start over. And Bud Malton gave me work um, so I could survive and be able to pay, pay rent and buy food during that time. 
and you know playing trumpet in, in a band that's essentially doing top 40 music you know with with 15 minute jazz set for people to dance to in the mood or whatever whereas artistically or musically is that what i ultimately want to do no but it gave me an opportunity to be able to pay the rent and to work on my chops and there's there's a positive side to everything you know i remember seeing winton do a master class one time for probably 2,000 kids where he talked about you know talked about this said every every situation we're in there's a positive and a negative to it he said it's important to be aware of the negative and it's even more important to focus on the positive positive. and um i remember he used an, as an example of the negative um the death of a family ma member what's more negative than that what's darker than like losing a parent or you know i mean it's horrible to think about but there's a positive in it and if you can find that positive um in even the darkest of times um then then you're going to be all right and he just he just showed by example when his when his father passed away recently the grace and dignity that he carried himself with the the, the statement that he made the statements that he made was so moving and so touching and so inspiring i'll never forget it you know seeing that man go through such a difficult time and and show such grace and such positivity in that and it's important in any difficult difficult time we go through to find the positive to it so you know, for me to be able to find a positive in playing music that, you know, no, I don't, I don't really enjoy playing in the mood. You know, I know how to and I can, but there was a positive to it, you know, because I was going through an embouchure change and struggling playing the trumpet. So in a top 40 band, a trumpet player, trumpet isn't utilized most of the time. I had to learn to play. You know, things like that you know, my girl, the horn line of my girl and whatever else. And that's, that's not a whole lot of playing. Um, but I was grateful to be able to do that playing and to be able to, to focus on my embouchure and building my chops, building my strength and get better. So um, was I selling out by doing that? No, I don't think I was selling out at all. Um, I was getting better. I was learning from it. I was finding positivity in it and it served me very well. It helped me to become the player that I am now, you know, so playing commercial music, I don't see as selling out at all. I think if you're playing something, it's a blessing. If you were lucky enough to get to make a living playing music, I don't see it as selling out. So some other people do that's, that's on them. And you have to ask them that question, but I don't, I don't see that as that. I know, you know, Chris Bodie is a good friend of mine. Um, for mm -hmm. example, Chris is a fine trumpet player. One of the best trumpet players alive. And I know a lot of people criticize him because they don't like the music that he's focusing on because he's capable of doing something more creative in terms of jazz. And I hear a lot of people criticize him and some of the music that he plays is commercial and whatever. Um, my hat's off to man. My hat is off to Chris Bodie. <laughs> <laughs> I have the utmost of respect for that man. Number one, he's an incredible trumpet player. Number two, he's a very nice man. Um, and, Number three, he plays music that he loves. And to be aware of your audience and want your audience to come out of, out of a performance feeling fulfilled and enjoying it, he's aware of his audience and he does play to his audience. He doesn't play down to them though. Mm -hmm. He plays music that he loves. And I've heard people actually use that term in describing him. And I've had discussions with those people to, you know, uh, to affect them, to, to say, man, he is not a sellout. He's playing music that he loves. He's incredibly smart how he does it. He's, um, he's aware of his audience and he's built a very large audience and he's highly successful. What's wrong with that? Yeah. You know, I think it's a beautiful thing. Somebody just typed in here, Kenny G is much the same. And I completely agree with that. I remember when I was a kid, when my father was still alive, I was in Las Vegas shooting pool with my dad at a bar and Kenny G came on the loudspeaker. Somebody put it in the jukebox, the, the tune Songbird. We all, we all know and love so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I started criticizing it to my dad. And my dad said, hold on a second. He stopped me in my track. He said, anybody who's successful playing instrumental music and bringing other people into the fold to hear instrumental music is all right by me. And it's like, yeah, okay, dad. That makes sense. Now, my dad, was, my dad was a commercial musician in Las Vegas. Like I mentioned earlier, he toured with Elvis. He played with the Rat Pack guys and made a living as the, lead, as the principal percussion or percussionist in Las Vegas. He was a first call guy. He played principal, played timpani with the Las Vegas Symphony back then. Now it's called the Las Vegas Philharmonic. But um, 
on the Jerry Lewis telethon, whenever Ed McMahon would go to the timpani role, that was my dad. Um, he made a, a living playing commercial music, but he loved jazz. He loved Milt Jackson. He loved Lionel Hampton. He, I grew up here in the Count Basie Orchestra because of my dad. You know, so um, music is music, man. And if you're making a living playing music and you're raising the consciousness, the awareness of other people uh, playing instrumental music, man, that's, that's a powerful, wonderful thing, man. So, you know, selling out, that's somebody's, that's a term that's frankly, I think, comes more from jealousy than anything, mm -hmm. you know. So I, it's something I don't frankly believe in, you know. So if somebody's playing music and making a living, man, God bless them. More power to them. Now, we've been talking a lot about what individuals can be doing in terms of developing their own career. But I want to broaden it a bit because one of the things I really love about these sessions on Zoom is we have a really wide range of people who are tuning in. Some people play, some people don't, some people are earlier in their careers, some people are later in their careers. So one thought would be, broadly speaking, when we're talking about young artists who are coming up, what can people in the broader community of jazz, other musicians, fans, friends, well-wishers, what can people be doing to support young musicians uh, in meaningful, concrete ways? Um, there are various ways where people can support um, the music in general. Is that what you're asking, to support the music in general? Or Yeah. And then specifically for artists who are, you know, coming up, who aren't names, um, how can, you know, one be helping people like that uh, from an, sort of the audience perspective? All right. Well, I mean, there are a lot of organizations that help artists, um, like Jazz at Lincoln Center, um, like my own nonprofit organization I started in Las Vegas, Jazz Outreach Initiative. We create programs for young musicians specifically, um, education programs, and we need money you know if anybody even a five dollar donation helps you know and um that's the first thing that comes to mind is support organizations that you know about that support young musicians um another thing is you know if you go out and you see there are a couple of restaurants like I, I live in midtown manhattan so there's a thousand restaurants around me if you see two restaurants next door to each other one of them has live music in it and the other one doesn't choose to eat at the restaurant that's supporting live music. Um, and a lot of those musicians playing in restaurants aren't making any money from the restaurant themselves. They just, they give them a, a stage or a place to play. They're playing for tips. So support the musicians, give them some tips, encourage them, applaud for them. That means a lot. That means a, more than you know, to have people clap after you play a solo, after you finish playing a song, to have an audience, to have people actually show appreciation and love for what you do, that, that goes a very long way. Um, I can't, how many, can't count how many times I've been on gigs where nobody is clapping after a solo, and by the end of the gig, you just feel like, why am I bothering doing this? Why should I even be here? Nobody appreciates it. Nobody likes us. We're just noise to them that they got to talk over. You know, don't talk over the musicians. Listen to the musicians. They're, you know, musicians are there, especially young musicians, they're playing their hearts out and they, everybody wants approval, everybody wants appreciation. So show them appreciation, listen to them, applaud for them, give them money. Even if it's, you know, even if it's a quarter you got in your pocket, put that in the tip jar. You know, they need it. You know, we all need it. Organizations right now, you know, are struggling and doing everything that they can to figure out how to stay afloat and stay alive. So if you're in a position to make a donation, you know, of $100 to an arts organization. Please do. It goes a long way, and it's much appreciated. If you're in a position to make an endowment, even better. <laughs> um, but, you know, just even, even if not, though, you know, you see some, some young people playing on the street, you know, stop and listen to it for a few minutes. Put a little, you know, put a little change in the, chip, in the tip jar. It goes a long way. It's not just about the money. It's about showing appreciation because uh, everybody needs that. And, and that goes a long way, you know. Um, if there's any specific organizations that you, you know of, that you like, that you want to support, there's so many. There's like a grassroots movement happening in jazz education in the country right now. There are a lot of organizations around. Um, there's Jazz Arts Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, Jazz Houston, 
in uh, Houston, Texas. And I guess I don't need to say where it is if it's in the title. Um, Jazz Outreach Initiative in Las Vegas. That's my, my nonprofit. Um, and, and so many more. And we're doing everything that we can think of to stay alive during these times because everything's been canceled. You know, so any donations anybody can make or show support, you know, if you follow an organization, if somebody were to go and follow Jazz Outreach Initiative and see some of the fun things we do, even to just see those things and then share it on Facebook, you know, help spread the word. You know, we all need that. Jazz at Lincoln Center obviously has a lot of content, you know, and I do my best to share as much as I can when I see Jazz at Lincoln Center has posted something. I share it on my personal page, I share it on my artist page, I share it on Jazz Outreach Initiative page, I share it on the Las Vegas Youth Jazz Orchestra page. So I got four pages that I share all these things on and it helps get, get the word out, you know. Light travels. Turn on the lights in the room and it's gonna brighten up the whole room, not just a corner. So we wanna, we wanna do that as much as we can. So even if it's just sharing something, um, that's extremely mean, meaningful. And um, you know, any support, any way you can think of support any of you um, can think of to support uh, the efforts being made uh, is greatly, greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Now, I do want to pause just in case uh, there are any questions from folks around developing a career, supporting the music, developing through the music as a, as a person. If there is anything, just raise your hand or you can type it into the Zoom chat window, or if you're on Facebook, you can type it into the Facebook chat. Uh, we're checking that too. Um, I'll keep going, uh, but if we see a question coming in, I will stop talking, which I'm sure everybody will be very happy about, <laughs> and, um, and we'll take the question. But I, I see one thing here, Seton, mm -hmm. from Paul M. Doherty. He said, back to Ray Charles, in the movie Ray, when he met women, they showed him feeling their wrists to see if the woman was heavy. Did I ever see him do that? Yes, I did, <laughs> which is interesting. But he actually did used to, when he would meet someone, he would, he would feel their wrist. It wasn't just women. Um, with, with men, he would kind of feel, he would do this on your arm, you know, and he want to see if you're big and muscular or whatever. He wanted to know what you look like. Mm -hmm. So he did, he did do that. Um, all right. Go ahead, Seton. Sorry. I'm, oh, looking no. the other, I'm, look, I'm looking to the other questions, too. That, There's that a question just, from Ali about how you joined the JLCO. Maybe that's a good story. Okay. Um, I mentioned, or I, I joined the JLCO um, back when it was the L <laughs> LCJO. Um, initially, um, well, first, I'm, I met Winton a few times before I worked with him. He probably doesn't remember when I first met him, but the first time I worked with him, um, I was hired by Reputation. He put together a band to do a series of videos called Marsalis on Music. Um, with uh, Seiji Ozawa, and we played, um, I think, uh, Yo-Yo Ma was on in, in that video series as well. But we, he put together a big band of mostly younger players um, up in Tanglewood, and we played opposite the Tanglewood Student Orchestra, which was conducted by Seiji Ozawa, and they were playing Ellington, or they were playing, um, rather, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, and we were playing with a big band. We were playing Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn's version of, of the Nutcracker, which was based, of course, on, on Tchaikovsky's. And showing, you know, the similarities and differences and all that, um, one movement at a time, one section at a time. That's when I first met Winton. That was mostly younger players. Um, and that's right around the time that Link, they were starting the program up through Lincoln Center. Back then it was called the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. And so we did those videos. That's when I first worked with Winton. We got along. We had a lot of fun. Um, he was very encouraging to me. I learned a lot. Um, he was very respectful of me. And, um, you know, we became friends. And um, then there was a concert not long after that. I think it was in December that same year. Um, they were doing a tribute to, to Louis Armstrong at Jazz at Lincoln Center. Um, and it, the, back then, it was before they had their own building. It was at Avery Fisher Hall, I believe. And um, it was a lot of incredible trumpet players, Clark Terry and um, uh, Nicholas Payton was on it, uh, John Faddis. It was, just, it was like an all-star thing with trumpet players. One of the trumpet players who was supposed to come up and do that was an incredible trumpet player from New Orleans named uh, Wendell Brunius. And Wendell had to cancel. And they called me and asked me, would I come in to, to sub to, to make this gig? So I did. 
And um, from that point on, I was, you know, kind of a regular in the mix of trumpet players. And that It wasn't a set orchestra yet. Um, Marcus Printup, Ryan Kaiser, Winton, obviously, were regularly in the section. Winton was there all the time. But um, there were other, other folks, too. Dan Miller, Roger Ingram. This is before Seneca Black, even. Um, Lou Soloff, uh, Marcus Belgrave. Um, I mentioned John Faddis, I think. Anyways, it was a circle of, of a lot of fantastic trumpet players, and I, was, I became, you know, kind of a regular part of that circle and, and was kind of in and out when they would need somebody. And, you know, I was probably, you know, I was on the list. You know, I probably wasn't the first call, but I, I got called pretty regularly. But um, at the time, I was, I was also working with, um, with John Hendricks, with his group. I was a regular member of his group. I was working with George Grunt's big band, who's a, George was a European or a Swiss composer and arranger, and he had a big band that I was a regular member of. I was also with Jimmy McGriff's uh, quartet or quintet. I was working a lot freelancing with different people, and I always live by the rule, whoever calls you first and you commit to, that's a gig that you do. You don't bail on somebody because somebody else pays, offers you more money or whatever. It's just not, you know, not a good way to, to be. You know, people don't get, get mad at you for saying no. They get mad if you cancel on them. So, and I learned that early on. So I, I lived by that rule and um, had to turn them down. Turn, I had to turn down Lincoln Center like three or four times in a row when they called me, and I kind of fell off the list as a result of that for a number of years. Um, but I was always in good standing with Winton. Um, I think he probably actually respected that, um, I would assume. Um, we've never actually spoken about it, but um, we were always cool. And then um, an opportunity came up where they needed somebody, and I you know, came in and made a rehearsal here and there, you know, if somebody was sick or whatever, you know, they would call me. So I started to get back in like several years later. And by this time, they'd formed a regular band. Um, the name of the band had changed from Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra to Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. Um, and it was a set, you know, set band. And um, then there, there was a tour that um, Sean Jones couldn't do. And so they called and asked me to do it. So I started working with a band uh, a little more regularly. Started, I did a couple tours, uh, subbing for Sean Jones. Uh, and um, then it's, at a certain point, Sean um, left the band uh, to go do some, something else. He, he left New York and followed his own path. And he's, I just got a text from a minute ago. I haven't read it yet. But um, Sean's a good friend. Um, but um, they were looking for somebody full, you know, full time. And I was in the mix with a couple other guys who I know and who are good friends of mine and, you know, I don't need to name any names or anything, but we all wanted the gig. <laughs> um, and for whatever reason, uh, went and called me for it. Um, and uh, I've never looked back. That was in uh, 2010. I joined the band full time. It was in 2008 that I did my first tour uh, subbing for Sean. So it was, you know, kind of two years of auditioning, touring with a band, you know, as a sub. And then in 2010, I got the call to join full time. Um, my first profession, my first gig as as a regular member of the band was playing with the Berlin Philharmonic um, piece Winton wrote called Swing Symphony, um, which is probably the hardest thing I've ever played to this day. And that was my first gig with the band was playing that. Um, so it was it was a challenge. But that's you know that's more that's how I I got to be a regular with uh, with the band. So it's sure. it's it's been 10 years now. So we have three questions that have come in. Uh, we'll start with one from Facebook, uh, which is around uh, your embouchure as you play uh, in terms of any changes you've had in your career or any changes you've decided to, you know, embark on uh, your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, I used to play, I did change my embouchure. I mentioned that earlier. It's the hardest thing I've ever done as a trumpet player in my career. Um, was to change my embouchure. I used to play, I can show you, I'm take the, take the mouthpiece off the horn. I used to play like that. If you look on, on my top lip, I played inside the red. I wasn't above this ridge where it goes from pink to white. I was inside the red like that, and that was my embouchure. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can notice. That was my embouchure um, growing up. And I had people tell me that I was going to have trouble when I got older, when I was a kid. And I was a cocky kid. I was stupid. I was arrogant. I was ego driven. And I was like, man, I'm already first chair all state. You know, what do you know? You know, and I didn't listen to him. And, you know, went on with my life and started my career. I was touring. I was working as a professional musician playing touring with the Mingus band and everybody else that 
I mentioned, had a, was having a successful career and started to have trouble with my embouchure. I would actually feel inside my lip, I would feel the muscle slip up out of my lip. And so it would just be like loose skin there playing and I'd have to stop because I couldn't get a sound out like that. And I reapply and, and continue playing. But I was having, and my endurance was very bad. The skin here, the pink is very, I think it's thinner than up here when it you know gets over the ridge on the lip to the white part of in my case um i think the skin up here is a little thicker um so i was having um significant problems with endurance with range and when it would when i'd feel it slip out it would be like it happened in the middle of a solo sometimes i'd have to stop and then recollect my thoughts and everything and then start up again it was it was becoming a huge problem mm -hmm. um and I spoke with many different people about how to change my embouchure and uh, got some great advice from a lot of great friends from Lou Soloff to um, Bob Milliken to Sam Burtis, who's a phenomenal trombone player in New York, um, and uh, Walt Blanton, my teacher in Vegas. And um, the person who I really focused on, um, who really seemed to understand it um, on another level was Bobby Shu who had been a mentor to me for many, many years and still is. Bobby's still around. If anybody's a trumpet player and wants to get lessons, I'm going to plug him now, bobbyshoe.com. Go there, sign up for lessons. He charges next to nothing. He only charges money because he, people, he feels people don't value the information unless they pay for it. Um, he's, he's a guru and one of the greatest teachers ever. Um, but Bobby told me I needed to take time off because all these muscles have memory. And unless I took the time off, I would struggle with uh, trying to change my embouchure. And I, that's what that was the case. I would, I didn't take any time off, and I go into gigs and I put the mouthpiece up here, you know, where it needed to be. And within four bars, the mouthpiece would just the mouthpiece would just slip right back down. You know, the muscles have memory, and they they grip it a certain way. So he said, you got to completely lose that memory. He said, take a month, a month and a half off from playing completely and then start over, put the mouthpiece where, where it should go. So you've got a good balance of upper and bottom lip. So you're above the red. Um, so that's what I did. I started rebuilding and it took me about a year before I started to feel good. I started to work again after about three months, but I would do gigs. I wouldn't play any solos. I would just focus on playing like third or fourth trumpet parts and the lower partial and just focus on keeping my corners tight and making, the, making sure my mouthpiece my mouthpiece was in the right place. And I got through it. It was frustrating. It was, you know, I seriously battled with depression during that time because I didn't know if I'd ever be able to play again. And that's when I really started doing a lot of work on myself and got away from the notion of if I'm not playing well, I'm a bad person. And I didn't put who I am as a person um, so much on how was my solo tonight. You know, because it used to be I'd have a bad solo or a bad moment in a solo and I'd be depressed for three days, you know, and I that was actually very helpful for me as a, as a human being to get over that and realize, you know, even if I have a bad night, it's OK. I'm, I'm still a good person, you know, and um, the the change I had to go through with the embouchure change was incredibly value valuable to me for many, many reasons. Um, and ultimately, I'm a better trumpet, now, trumpet player now than I would have ever been able to be with my old embouchure. There's a second question that came in um, on the Zoom chat, um, where I think uh, it, it's from the perspective of drumming, but I think as a trumpet player, you have a similar issue, which is balancing the needs of practicing against the realities of you know, living with family or, you know, with roommates, uh, with neighbors, um, and finding that particular space of practicing and developing while also noting the reality of living around other people. Yeah. I mean, that's an issue for a lot of people, man. I have a friend who lives in the building where I live who um, actually had somebody sue him and try and get him evicted because he was practicing a saxophone. Um, <laughs> I've always... I've just, for whatever reason, always done this. Every apartment that I move into, as soon as I move in, I open all the windows and play as loud as I can all day long into the night as late as I can just to annoy everybody, to let them know I'm there and then wait for somebody to complain. And as soon as they complain, 
then I stop. Um, I, you know, it's, it's kind of like a little kid testing his boundaries, but it's also marking your territory. <laughs> Um, there are laws that state that you are allowed to practice a musical instrument in your apartment up until a certain hour. So <laughs> now the last time I did that was when I moved in here to where I'm living and I moved in here in 2002. So it's been a while. But um, after I do that, then I, I write a letter and I print, print out like a dozen copies of it and I lay it in front of everybody's door on my floor the person directly above me and directly below me um, and just state who I am, give them my, my phone number, my email address, uh, my apartment number, say, listen, I'm a professional trumpet player. This is what I do for a living. I need to maintain my uh, skill set. I need to practice. Um, the last thing I want to do is to make anybody un uncomfortable in their own homes. So if it's ever a bother to you, please let me know. Call me, text me, whatever, and I, I will work with you, work with your schedules. Um, so I, so I'm not a, a nuisance to you as a trumpet player. And, um, since, uh, since I've done that, I haven't had any problems. People appreciate that you even think about that. Um, I did have a thing in the beginning of this pandemic because normally I'm on the road, you know, five months, six months out of the year. And now all of a sudden I'm home all the time and having to practice and, you know, we've done several recordings for uh, Jazz Lincoln Center. We just released one that we did for a tribute to Miles Davis. Um, and I'm also recording Sesame Street from home. And so I've, I've had to deal with a neighbor across the hall who wasn't happy with me playing. Um, there was one day in particular where I had three different projects I had to record in one day. And um, I started around 11 and I played basically most of the time <laughs> till like seven at night and they knocked on my door and were like, man, come on. <laughs> and so, um, so we talked and I said, listen, and they, they were actually new. I hadn't given them the letter. So I said, here's my name, you know, and asked them their name. And I was, I was polite and nice, you know, and I said, you know, I don't want to disturb you, but this is what I do for a living. And we're in lockdown. I can't go to the studio. I can't go on the road. I have to do it from home. I certainly don't want to offend you or upset you. So are there hours generally that will be cool for you, um, cool with you for me to play? And so we talk, talked it out and came up with uh, a window every day where I can play without bothering them. And I said, okay, cool. I'll make sure to, to ad, ad, uh, adhere to those rules. I, and I told him, I said, occasionally, I may need to do, you know, play a little earlier, a little bit later than that, but it's not going to be often, and I'll make, make sure I'll let you know if I'm going to. And so, you know, they're cool with it. So I think, you know, <laughs> you know, starting off my, you know, life in a new place by opening the windows and blasting to test the parameters and, you know, test my boundaries is um, maybe kind of childish, but at the same time, it's letting them know who I am and letting them know that I'm serious and this is what I do and they're going to have to put up with me. And it can be like this or we can work together, you know? So it's, it's, it's working out just fine, but it has been an issue before. Yeah, that idea of um, acknowledging their sign while also stating where you're at. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, this came from the, the chat within Zoom uh, from Eric uh, who writes, I've always struggled with sight reading. Do you have any resources you could recommend? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to struggle with sight reading. Um, and the person who actually taught me how to get better at sight reading was my mom. Um, when I was a little kid, you know, my mom played, uh, played piano. And in church, she was the organist for the church. So when I was a little kid, like three, four years old, I used to sit on the, on the organ bench next to my mom in church while she was playing the organ. And she asked me to turn the page for her. You know, and she would just nod like this when it was time to turn the page, you know, but through doing that, um, I started to learn how to read music because I would follow along the top line as she would play. And I would, I realized that when she got to the last line, that's when she would nod. So I started to be able to count one, two, three, four, understand the, a little bit about the value of the notes. And so that, that's how I started learning to read music was through my mom. And then after I, you know, years later, I started trumpet at 11 and um, 
played in junior high school. I was first year in junior high school band and, and jazz band. And the summer between junior high and high school, um, I wanted to be able to make the top jazz band. And I was afraid my sight reading wasn't good enough. And so I talked to my mom about it and, um, you know, said, how do I get better at sight reading? Well, she had a whole bookshelf filled with piano music. Um, so she said, all right, we'll, we'll set up a little station for you here. Set up a music stand in a chair. She said, every day, I'm going to pull down a different uh, book of music and put it in front of you. And she said, I want you to play the top line on the piano music in time. Don't stop if you make a mistake. Just keep going, you know, and sight read it. Sight read something new every single day. Um, so that's what I did for a summer for, you know, over, you know, two and a half, three months, whatever it was. Um, different, different piece of music, you know, different page of the same book, whatever, but something new every time I didn't stop and work it out and fix it or whatever. I sight read, practice sight reading every day for, uh, for a summer. And I got to high school and I was the best sight reader in the band. I was my freshman year. I was lead trumpet in the top jazz band. Um, and it's because of that. You know, sight reading isn't something that happens uh, magically. You can't all of a sudden magically sight read because something clicks because you get it. It's like anything else. You've got to practice it. You want a good sound, you've got to play your long tones. You want good technique, you've got to practice your technical studies. Just like anything else. LeBron James um, didn't become a good basketball pra uh, player because he didn't practice. He, you know, how many, how many free throws a day do you think he's practiced on average over his life? And he's still a bad free, free thrower. <laughs> um, <laughs> I believe those are fighting words. Well, I mean, I love LeBron. I think he's, he's an incredible person and, and, and the best all-around player in the game today. But um, free throws are one of his nemesis. The, you know, the nemesis, is that the right? Is that nemesi? I don't know. Nemesis. Nemesis, thank you. I, I knew you would know that, Seton. Um, in any case... To get good at anything, man, you've got to shed. You've got to practice. There's no way around it. And um, so that, that's how I learned to, to become a good sight reader is by practicing it. And it doesn't, you know, once you get it, you get it, but you've got to practice it. So I spent a summer working on sight reading, and I've been a good sight reader ever since. So I know we're a little bit over time. So what I'd like to do now is hand it uh, back over to uh, Chloe. I'm going to type into the chat window here on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, if there are questions we didn't get to, I'm going to give you an email address that you can reach out to us and we'll make sure it gets answered. But uh, yeah, Chloe, over to you. Great. Thank you both um, for giving me a day off there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm usually uh, doing lots of hosting and moderating, but I just got to sit back and enjoy that. So thank you both. Um, guys, thanks for joining us today. Um, like always, we're hosting free live events every day throughout the coming weeks. Uh, more master classes, conversations, um, more master classes with the JLCO. Um, speaking of which, our next one will be this Friday with, um, I think, Kenny, you know this guy, Marcus Printup. Um, it's going to be part one of a two-part class called The Great Trumpet Masters. Um, Marcus will guide viewers through the innovations and styles of the many trumpet legends who have shaped the instrument's voice in jazz. Ooh, that's going to be a fun one. Yeah, from mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong to Roy Eldridge to Miles Davis and to our own Wynton Marsalis. Um, that'll be Friday, June 19th at this same time on Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, but please um, follow us um, our, uh, our full schedule is on our website, that's jazz.org, and you can get your links to your Zooms and your Facebook Lives there as well. Um, the last thing I'll say is, if it's within your means, guys, please consider making a donation. As, as Kenny was saying earlier, um, you know, this is a difficult time for us as a nonprofit, so we are, um, we are trying to sort of be humble here and ask our audience to help us get through this time um, by making any sort of donation that you're able to. Um, we're committed to in entertaining, enriching, and expanding a global community for jazz. And we're so, so grateful for you all um, just, just by being here. It's, it's, it's really great. Um, so the last thing I guess is, yeah, so Seton um, through that email address in the chat, feel free to ask any questions. He's usually on the end, end of those um, emails and he's, he knows everything, so he's the guy. Um, and then just keep just, just just keep up with us on social media if you'd like Jazz Link Etc on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at jazz.org. That's jazz.org spelled out. Um, and thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, Eden. We'll see you next time. I'll turn it over to Kenny and say goodbye. 
Thank you, Chloe. Thank you for all that you're doing. You're doing so much. It's it's so appreciated by by all of us. My pleasure. Well. Truly. Thank you, Seton, and thanks for everybody for uh, for tuning in. I hope you got something out of this. And um, you know, Seton, if any questions come up for me, let me know. Just give me a call, and we'll we'll deal with them. You got it. And um, that's it, man. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, man. Thanks Thank you, all. everyone. Take care, guys. We'll see you Friday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Be safe. Be safe, everybody. Be well.